All right, welcome back to the show today. We are talking about general managers or presidents of basketball operations. Pobos is what I'm gonna call them today. I'm not gonna call them that today because when you break this up into TikTok videos and I say Pobos, no one's gonna know what I'm talking about. The general manager is the most important position in basketball, the most important job, not position like forward point guard, but the general manager is basically the CEO of a basketball team, even though most NBA teams actually do have a CEO. The GM is the one that is in the most most control of the success of the basketball team when it comes to wins and losses. A lot of times the president of basketball operations is who we call the GM. Sometimes they'll split those roles in two just so one person has more control of building the actual roster and the other person is in charge of anything related to money all the way down to how much stadium parking should cost, which usually ends up being enough that I park under the freeway. Bob Myers of the Golden State Warriors and James Jones, the newly appointed president of basketball basketball operations with the Suns. They both share that title. They both share the president of basketball operations and general manager title. I would assume once you get to that level at the NBA, you're gonna be a bit of a control freak. You're gonna want everything to be just so within your organization. And you're going to want to fulfill the duties of both roles. Sometimes even the coach will be the general manager. Has this ever happened before? It has. Don Nelson in 1976 was appointed both the coach and the general manager of the Milwaukee Bucks. That is what I call taking on a accountability for the success of a team. There's literally no one else to blame but Don Nelson, the greatest coach of all time, some would say. General managers and presidents of basketball operations need to know everything about the salary cap. That includes exceptions, bird rights, luxury tax. They need to know everything. They also need to know how to negotiate with a player and an agent in a way that won't upset that player. For example, Sean Marks offered Kyrie Irving an extension this summer, summer of 2022. I don't know when you're watching this, but he offered him an extension extension of $250 million over the course of five years, but that extension had games played contingencies. This made it obvious that the Nets organization was a little bit salty because of Kyrie's lack of attendance over the past couple years. This started a storm, including Kevin Durant getting upset on behalf of Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant requesting a trade, which was ultimately denied, also requesting that both Steve Nash, the coach of the Brooklyn Nets, and general manager Sean Marks be fired from the Nets organization another one that was denied, at least for the time being. Could Sean Marks have made Kyrie Irving the same offer in a more diplomatic way? I don't know, how would I know that? I have no idea how that went down. General managers also have to handle personnel issues, like Ime Udoka. This summer, again, summer of 2022, had an affair with a staff member, a female staff member that was consensual, or maybe it wasn't consensual. I don't know the details of the story. No one really does. It was a big mess, a lot of people were in the dark, and I don't want to get into the details, but Brad Stevens, the general manager of the Celtics, was the one who ultimately had to make the call to punish Ime Udoku with a one-year suspension. General managers are also responsible for draft picks and scouting. Not to beat a dead horse, but I want to talk about Luka Doncic. In the 2018 draft, the Kings and Vladi Divac, the general manager at the time, chose Marvin Bagley while Luka Doncic was still on the board. Obviously, this seems like a colossal mistake because Luka Doncic has been a three-time first-team All-NBA, and Marvin Bagley, I think, is in Detroit, and I don't even know if I'm right about that. Divac eventually stepped down as general manager of the Kings, but he did take responsibility for making the wrong pick when it came to the 2018 draft. Divac says that ownership wanted Luka, but he thought Bagley had more of an upside, which, hey, we all make mistakes. I possibly could have made the same mistake, and good on Vladi for eating his sandwich and recognizing that he should have made a different call. You gotta respect Vladi for that. What are general managers backgrounds? How do they get into this job? Well, one interesting thing is 70% of the general managers in the league now played college basketball and 30% of them actually played in the NBA. Another journey is scout. A lot of them were talent scouts for teams before they became general managers. Let's take Masai Ujiri, the now general manager of the Toronto Raptors. He was a unpaid scout for the Orlando Magic. He actually had to pay for his own travel when he went on recruiting trips, or he had to crash with another scout that was getting paid. Maybe this is played up as the romantic journey for Masai Ujiri, or maybe the NBA is that cheap. All this money floating around and you can't get Masai Ujiri his own Motel 6 room? I don't know, I don't think so. It seems a little bit unbelievable, but shame on Orlando if that's the case. Daryl Morey, now general manager or president of basketball operations at the Sixers and formerly the Houston Rockets, 
Didn't have a job in basketball before he was the president of operations at the Celtics. He worked for Ernest Young, a consultancy, and got his MBA at MIT. He was a big old dork, and then he got into sports. Daryl Morey has been a GM for 15 years, and he's only 50. At 35, he was a general manager of an NBA team. Bravo. I'm sorry for calling him a dork. GMs used to operate in the shadows. Most people didn't know who was managing their team. All of a sudden, the team would get draft picks, and that's who they got. Or maybe your favorite player would get traded. You didn't know who was responsible for that, but that's changed with the now 24-hour sports news cycle. You know exactly who manages your favorite team and probably know a couple other managers in the league. This has become a problem. Sam Presti of the Oklahoma City Thunder in 2019 received death threats for trading away Paul George and Russell Westbrook. These weren't the only death threats. John Weisbrod, the general manager of the Orlando Magic in 2004, traded away Tracy McGrady and someone was so upset, multiple people were actually so upset that they left death threats on his front door. I don't know if this is true. This is what he said. This is hearsay. I'm a little bit incredulous, but apparently someone taped a death threat to his front door and then another person wrote in a, in a window on some fog in a window that he was gonna die because he traded away Tracy McGrady. Again, I don't necessarily believe this. I think turnover rate with GMs is way higher now because like I said, everyone knows who their general manager is and with social media, fans have a voice. They can reach out to people. There can be a general dissent with the leadership of an organization. So there is some responsibility from ownership to listen to their fans. And that starts with firing the general manager. I think the boss of the general manager is kind of the fans now. Personally, I think the biggest testament to the quality of a general manager is his ability to make good trades because getting a free agent really isn't something that the general manager has any control of. A guy is either going to go to a city he wants to live in or he's going to go to the highest bidder. But a trade, the only people responsible for a trade are the two general managers involved or three general managers involved or four general managers involved if it's a huge ass trade. That's why I want to talk about Masai Ujiri again when he traded away DeMar DeRozan, Jakob Pertl, and a first round pick for Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green. This honestly doesn't seem like a great trade at the time because Kawhi Leonard had one year left on that deal. It was a total rental and he had a bum knee. He didn't know how good he was going to be. He didn't know how many games he was going to play. But luckily it all worked out. Kawhi played 60 games that season and he killed it in the playoffs. Killed it so hard that he was the finals MVP and Toronto got its first championship. This would have looked really bad if it didn't work out. Think about it. They would have traded away DeMar DeRozan, a beloved Toronto Raptor who wanted to be a Raptor for life, for a guy who didn't like the cold and was definitely going to leave the following season. Another big move that offseason was they fired Dwayne Casey. Dwayne Casey was the coach of the year and they fired him that season. He won that season. They took the guy that was the best coach by the media and said, you're canned, you're fired. We haven't won in the playoffs against the Cavs, so you got to get out of here. And they hired Nick Nurse and they won the championship, Nick Nurse first season. These were huge risks. I believe if Toronto hadn't had a great season, probably if they hadn't made the finals, Masai Ujiri would have been canned because these would have looked like stupid moves, but since they worked out, they were brilliant. So, good on, Masai Ujiri. All right, if you wanna know more about general managers, check out my video on tanking. I talk about Sam Hinkie and the Sixers and what is known as the process. Um, there's more about general management in that and uh, strategies about it. Thank you for being here. Much love. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you like it or share it with a friend. I'd appreciate that. So be good.